When our first documentary, The Road to Southport Pier, was aired in 2017 on YouTube, there was a comment from one viewer. Lancaster's in the northwest. There's more to the northwest than just Manchester. Why weren't we even mentioned? My response was along the lines that within a two week spell, there's only so much we can do. And we can't go up and down the whole county and do every band. Our second foray covered Liverpool, Chester and the Wirral. And now we're about to address that balance by visiting Lancaster. Lancaster has seen a Sunday lunchtime jazz session for some 30 plus years at the old John O'Gaunt. It's a small city centre pub that's hosted live music of all shades over the years. It's been likened to playing in a train corridor due to its unique narrow construction. The Sun Street Stompers are its resident house band every Sunday lunchtime. Here's its ebullient leader, Reed player Barry Marshall. Well, when Petit Fleur came out, mm -hmm. I fell in love with it, but I wasn't interested in playing the clarinet then just because of that tune. It's when I heard the Chris Marber band and I heard the improvisation, particularly Whistling Rufus, yep. which they did, it come, knocks me, and I just wanted to play. And then my brother-in-law, who is also a clarinet player, he used to play with Alan Duckles mm -hmm. in the early days, was in Canada. He was, a, he was my sister's boyfriend, and they bought me a clarinet. And the funny thing about this is, it was actually wrapped in brown paper, it was a clarinet shaped parcel. <laughs> <laughs> It's like stories it's wrapped of, in brown paper, like yeah. the stories of Johnny Dodds with his um, clarinet player wrapped in newspaper. Oh, that's right, mm. but <laughs> little band, well he had a little band of quartos, the Morecambe Bay Jazz Six, and we weren't very good. We didn't last long, because rock and roll came along and killed everything, as you know. That's when I first played in public. A friend of mine called Steve Thorne took the pub over, he took the pub over, and he called me and he says, I want a band on a Sunday lunchtime, can you get your own together for me? So I did, I just, yeah, when Dave was in it, I was in it, and Alan was in it, and a guy called Paul Guppy. So it was actually the landlord's idea, not mine. And right opposite the pub where I seat I lived on, it was called Sun Street. So that's why it's called the Sun Street Stompers. <laughs> Very well, because we get uh, we get it not very crowded, but enough. And we get a lot of passing train because people come down from the station and hear it. Mm -hmm. So we get people coming in because they hear the band. Yeah.
Barry's policy has always been to let his band play the first half, and then to encourage sitters in to play with them in the second half, but in a controlled manner, not a free-for-all, undisciplined jam session. Well, the, the other one was, uh, you know, Adrian Wilkinson. Oh, Adrian, Adrian. fine player. Yeah. Well, well, he he came to, he was still at school, I think, mm -hmm. and he used to come and sit in with the band, and never play with him, play with that, and he liked my playing. And it was my, hearing me play that made him go to Leeds. Maybe mm -hmm. well, you know what Adrian's like now. I think he's, I think he's, it was in that Sid Lawrence now, I think. Yes. First, first ring with Sid Lawrence. It's not bad, is it? Not bad at all. <laughs> Eddie Culvert. I thought he was worse. A, Eddie Culvert, I thought, was absolutely fantastic. And the only mm -hmm. syncopated music that I heard in my classical uh, parental home was... Um, no, no, you've Coons. missed the one. Charlie Coons. Oh, yes. Charlie Coons. <laughs> so those two things... Uh, Eddie Calvert and Charlie Kunz made me want to play syncopated music. Did and, you th and, and then, um, uh, when I, when I, this was a, I learned the trumpet at school, and um, I was asked to give a lecture on the Bren gun uh, to, to the uh, core people, and um, whilst I could strip a Bren gun very easily, I couldn't lecture. So I went and joined the band. And that's where I learned to actually play properly military music. Was that during so national service? No, school. School oh. corps. Oh, school. Yeah. yeah. And from thence you went to a band? Then one of my best friend's dad used to be a dance band player, a bit, a bit like Charlie Kuntz, and he got all his old mates together and they taught us to play uh, dance band arrangements. Mm -hmm. I couldn't busk a note in those days, but I could play bugle call rag backwards, <laughs> <laughs> which I couldn't do now. <laughs> so school was very, you know, became very significant, and uh, I did. I did uh, the trumpet was the all important thing for me then. Didn't care much about anything else. And then when you left school. Um, the Vocational Guidance Association suggested I should be a landscape architect and uh, that's what I studied in Cheltenham and um, that's what I've enjoyed all my life as, a, as, a, as my main profession. But I think I played at the last session Roy Kirby ever played at. Um, we were passing through Cheltenham on the way to uh, Bude Jazz Festival, mm -hmm. and I told Roy, I phoned Roy up and told him, and he uh, he said I'll try and get a gig together, and uh, right. and he did, and we had all sorts of uh, people from the past um, come to that gig, and uh, I think that was the last one he did and before he died. Mm -hmm. Jumping from trombone to trumpet is a bit of a strain. Slide or valve? Both. I got rid of the valve actually. <laughs> but it, it was given, I, I sold it to someone and when he died his wife gave it back to me. So <laughs> but it's a Over the years a number of young musicians have been blooded at these sessions. One such is Jim Swinnerton, a fine young bass player son of the late Jack Swinnerton, who organised the bands in Manchester at the MSG, Manchester Sports Guild, that we covered in our first documentary. My grandmother had just died and left me uh, a small sum in a will. Uh -huh. And I was certainly at an age where it could have been wasted, that. And, <laughs> and as my time, I was working, I was trained to be an electrician. And it was being a young lad, I was asked to get in the, the brew butty orders. And this particular place where I was in Lancaster, I was working at the school, was it Ripley? Uh, uh, yeah, I think Ripley School. And there was a butty shop near there that had a music shop next to it. And Jesus. there was a double bass in there. Oh, yeah, I love that. <laughs> and I did. And 
sort of went from there. Uh, and I, I have to ask, the Million Dollar Quartet. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, well, I think, I think of, uh, there was a bass player from Scotland. Um, uh, oh, Roy Percy. Roy Percy, yes. He, I think they were looking for a double bass player. And sure enough, I got the call. And... It seemed like a great idea, and it was. I uh, obviously toured over this country, uh, purely a rock and roll thing, not jazz. I do have a, a little bit of a passion for rock and roll, I have to say. It, it's uh, it's all music. Great. I was touring around with them. They even took me to. I went as far as New Zealand uh, with them. In fact, the last uh, session I ever did with them was in Mumbai. And now. The new club in Garstang. Yes, uh, we've only had one session so far. Uh, yes, I decided uh, to form the Garstang Jazz Club as there's not an awful lot of music in the area. And uh, I thought to have it on a Thursday afternoon as well, just to, well, just see, testing the water at the minute, but it seems to be the people who did come uh, was it, it uh, certainly very enjoyable food on and uh, uh, I get to play locally <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs>
research. Okay. And um, you started playing at primary school. At yeah, that's night. right. Yeah. Cornet. Cornet to start with. Um, so at school they were offering everyone to learn brass instruments, mm -hmm. and all my mates were doing it. So I thought it'd be a good idea to join in. So yeah, I um, I chose a trumpet, but there's only one trumpet in the whole school, so they had more cornet. So I got the cornet, Fair which enough. was great. I enjoyed the cornet. Yeah. And I started off in the brass bands, local brass bands. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously cornet was the instrument they used there, so yeah. it was better than the trumpet in one respect. And from the jazz historical perspective, Armstrong and Oliver started off on cornets. Oliver stayed on cornet. Yeah. And um, Louis, of course, went on to trumpet. Eh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you can still play jazz on the cornet and it sounds oh, very sure. nice. So. Absolutely. Rising Star Award. Yeah, that was back in 2012. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't cling on to that one for much longer, I think. I think six <laughs> years ago now. So oh. I must be the falling star now, as everyone no. always jokes. But no, that was nice. That was a nice award to, yeah. to have from the British Jazz Awards. Time flies when you're having fun. Certainly does. And it was great for, you know, it's good to put on your CV and it helps get work. So, it, you know, it works both ways. Sure. Maybe once you've got something like that. And of course, you had the trip to New Orleans with British Airways. Yeah, that was, that's a year ago now, back in February. Mm -hmm. That was amazing. Um, great precedent, because Barber did it um, in um, 1979, when yeah. they first started going to direct from Heathrow to um, New Orleans. Yeah, that's it. And they must have stopped, I suppose. They this did. was the first yeah. one they're starting up again. Yes, it's been a 15-year gap. Yeah. No, that was yeah. That was amazing. So we played on the plane. Yeah. And then when we got there as well, we also played the Leroy Jones, sat in with him and his band, and a few other bands. On you know just on the streets really, yeah. I took up flying about five years ago. It was always something I wanted to do, and uh, the local airport, Welshport, was my closest airfield, and they were offering trial lessons. So I went out for my first trial lesson, and once I did that, that was it. Then I was hooked. So from then on, yeah, I did my license, and then I've just recently done my instructor rating too. So I've just started teaching at oh, excellent. as well, so that's good fun. It's another string to your bow. Yeah, another string to my bow. I think it's many strings I can possibly get in this, this day and age. Oh yeah, because a, a musician never knows where the next job's coming from. Exactly. So it's always good to have something different, and it's another one of my passions, so music and flying go together quite well. You were at Whitley Bay last year. Whitley Bay last year, and again this year. Smashing. So that's going to be really good. I really enjoyed that last year. That was to totally different to all the other festivals I've done. But it was really good. So yeah, it was an honour to be asked back again this year. Well, it's a, it's a repertory um, festival rather than um, band A and band B. Exactly, band C. yeah. So it's totally different in that, response, in that respect because there'll be like an hour of somebody from that era, they'll choose somebody and they'll do all of his tunes in a certain way, then the next hour will be something totally different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's exciting really, because it's not anything I've ever done before. So.
how did you come to start playing jazz piano? I started when I was um, uh, about four or five years old. I was at home, my mum had a piano. I just started playing, I was listening to um, a lot of Elvis Presley records. I thought, I want to sound like that piano player. I like that. Yeah. So I started impersonating that really and then took it from there. I had some lessons when I was about six or seven, but it didn't really work out too well. Got thrown out of those. There was a band that was put together called the New Constellation Jazz Band, which is supposedly young people um, playing old people's music. <laughs> so um, we were all about 22, 23, that sort of age. Emil was Emil's 10 years older than me. Yeah. He was in his early 30s and we went over to uh, Switzerland to the, the Kasabar in Zurich and we did a stint in the Kasabar. Yes, you're smoking. You know it well. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so we did a stint there, which was a bit of a you know, baptism of fire. Um, and yeah, that was great. We, had, we did, a, did that band for a couple of years and I moved down to London in early 2000s and um, worked in Emile's band, The Fallen Heroes, for a, quite a while, quite a long time. Still play them occasionally. And then, of course, um, one of your lodgers was Amy Roberts. That's right. She lived in when she was at the RMCM, Old Northern College Music. She um, she stayed in my house for two years. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And she joined the Chris Barber band when she was living there. I think I, just, I remember her getting the email saying, uh, you know, do you want to come and join this band? She thought it was a joke. Said, well, Chris Barber, I can't possibly, but it was true. So. It did wonders for her career. Yeah, absolutely. It did. Well, we've all played together. Any, we were playing together anyway in various bands, um, notably Dave Donohoe's band, we were the, sort of the backing trio in that and um, decided through that that we should, we should start a little, um, little trio of our own with that, with, with that personnel, more traditional than my other trio that I've got, um, right. the Tom K trio which is a bit more mainstream, um, so we thought we'd do a little bit more um, yeah, a little bit more traditional stuff, a bit of Fats Waller and, you know, Errol garner -y things that I like, you know, so... Smashing! Yep. Another yeah. alumnus is Rosie Harrison, a talented reed player and vocalist who now leads her own band, Deco Delight. She's played with, amongst others, the Loon Valley Band, another local Fylde Coast Orchestra. My nana was um, a professor at the Leeds College of Music. Ah! My mum was an entertainer, singer, in a trio with her sisters who performed all around the world and so I was taught the piano at home by my mum and then I went to school and we were lucky when I was at school because we had good peripatetic music teachers, mm -hmm. people who'd been ex-professional and music lessons were paid for so that was good too and they said do you want to play a flute or do you want to play a clarinet? So I chose the clarinet, and that's when I was seven. I'm still playing the same clarinet. <laughs> um, so I did that at school, did the exams, and then my next peripatetic teacher said, uh, we, have a, we have a jazz band, but you can't play the clarinet in the jazz band, you'll have to play a saxophone. So I got a saxophone from school and went home with a saxophone. <laughs> learned to play the saxophone and joined the uh, Lancashire Schools jazz band. And then I went to sixth form college and I didn't do music A level because I didn't like composition <laughs> and I still don't. <laughs> so I didn't do music A level but they had a big band. Mm -hmm. So I joined the big band at sixth form college and uh, we were on Blue Peter twice and we were on Songs of Praise from the tower ballroom and we toured around a bit and then I did my A-levels and then after I'd done my A-levels I decided I didn't really know what I wanted to do so I had to stay for another year <laughs> at sixth form <laughs> right. and my uh, sixth form tutor said to me I play in a band, a swing band, at the uh, Working Men's Club in, in Thornton Cleveleys. Okay. And our tenor sax player is poorly, and will you come and, and sit in? So I said yes, and Julie went to the, this Working Men's Club, and the band was called Sixteen Men Swinging. <laughs> <laughs> and I turned up. <laughs> and they didn't tell me. <laughs> I got that. 
So I then joined 16 Men Swinging and I was with them for about, about seven years. And then one of the members of 16 Men Swinging said to me, I'm in a traditional jazz band and our singer is leaving and would you like to come and have a go at singing? I think I'd done a bit of singing with the big band things, you know, the Vera Lynn type stuff yeah. when we did a, a 40s night or something like that. So off I went to do that and I only knew a couple of songs and our first gig was on, on a boat on Windermere. <laughs> so, and I think I sang Bill Bailey and maybe one of the song. So the band called Deco Delight was formed from a couple of the members of Lean Valley and myself and um, an entertainer, a variety entertainer, very seasoned pantomime dame uh, called Mr Pete Lindup. So he plays the trumpet and does all the announcing, all the jokes <laughs> and I play the clarinet saxophone and sing and then we have Lawrence Marshall on the banjo who mm -hmm. is also in the Sun Street Stompers. Indeed. Yes, and the Lynn Valley Jazz Band. Indeed. And he's a, he's sort of the historian, the record collector, the person who knows who wrote everything and when. So, and I did go to university in the end and get my degree in music, oh. just without the composition part. <laughs> <laughs> Are you allowed? Yeah. Yes. Well, obviously yes. you were. Yes. yes. I went to, uh, to Lancaster, and there were eight of us on the course, and I went in as a clarinetist. Mm -hmm. There were five of the clarinetists on the course. We'd all done the same exams, we all played the same tunes. So at the end of the first year, we did a module on Baroque music and jazz. Mm -hmm. And we had to do a concert. And I said to my tutor, who was a classical pianist, uh, I said, can I sing some jazz? Uh, and I showed him the chords for Am I Blue? Oh yeah. Just the, the, the very mm -hmm. basic cosmic now. Yeah, we can, we can do that. So I switched then. So I stopped doing the clarinet at the end of the first. I, I carried on playing, obviously, I carried on playing the clarinet, but I switched a voice because mm -hmm. there were just too many clarinetists doing the same <laughs> thing. So I also ended up doing bits and pieces of work with him as well. Moving northeast, we come to the town of Carnforth, probably most famous as the setting for the 1940s movie Brief Encounter. Today, Carnforth Station hosts the Welsh respected High Society Jazz Band on the third Friday lunchtime of each month. Now, what, what made you pick up the clarinet? I'd always wanted to play the clarinet, um, even before I got really interested in jazz. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, my folks couldn't afford a clarinet, so I had a violin for a short while. <laughs> <laughs> no difference but, there? Uh, no, not at all. But I was very pleased after about two, three years to, uh, to finally acquire um, a clarinet and um, I was in a group of uh, people who, in Newcastle this was, I was born and raised in Newcastle a long time, um, who had similar interests and wanted to form some sort of band of their own, mm -hmm. but involved in the formation of uh, a new band there. Um, now long forgotten by all but the most elderly of Carlisle residents, uh, and that's called the, the was called the Black Tulip Orchestra. Um, but again, it's evolved into other bands, and uh, we uh, we wound up playing quite a bit in Carlisle. Yeah, late sixties. We uh, we also formed the first Kendall Jazz Club, and. Uh, where, where was that located? That was located in a hotel in Kendall, which is no longer there. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but it eventually moved to the Brewery Arts Centre.
always wanted a guitar. I wanted to be uh, in a pop group, just as you do. Uh, and I got my first, probably my first real guitar. I started playing with um, a number of folk groups, really, mm -hmm. because folk became quite big, and um, particularly in the Manchester area. And uh, it took me through college. I played a lot of uh, folk music, and um, I stuck to the guitar, really. And then. I thought, I'd really like to take up the banjo, I'd, I'd like to do uh, a lot of this bluegrass stuff, that kind mm -hmm. of thing, and the folky music. So I bought a banjo. The only problem was, I couldn't find a, a tutor to, uh, right. to tell me how to play this thing. <laughs> and people said, well, you tune it like a guitar, and I thought, well, that's cheating a bit, perhaps. Well, it's good enough for Eddie Cotton. So, <coughs> absolutely. And Lonnie Donegan. And I thought, <coughs> I'll just try something a little bit different. And I was just beginning to get to grips with um, what they call the mountain tuning on mm -hmm. the on the five string banjo. When Alan Duckles, who was a colleague of mine at school, um, Alan was used to sort of regale us with stories at lunchtime about his uh, exploits with his band, and he just began um, to start playing again after a bit of a break. And then um, I said to him one day, when why don't you play in a school concert at Christmas? We do a big concert for the children. And they said, oh no, he couldn't possibly do this. He would need a banjo and a bass player. And I said, well, I'll play banjo. And um, I finally persuaded him to say yes. So I went home and I learned, wrote three numbers so that we could play in the concert at, home, at school. And. Um, I thought no more about it really until I said, so, Well, why don't you come along to the Park Hotel where his new band, the new Riverside Jazz Band, was playing every Thursday? Why don't you come along and have a listen and sit in? And uh, I did. I started to go along and uh, occasionally just sit in with the band. And within three months, the, they had a young lady playing banjo at that time in the band and she left and Alan said would you like to be in the band <laughs> and I said well yes of course I would but I spent the, uh, the entire Easter holiday that year Alan gave me a great stack of records I said go away and listen to those right. he gave me a chord book go away and copy that out and <coughs> I had to learn lots and lots of uh, new chords and numbers and so on so that I could be in the band and so the the banjo bit as far as the uh, the jazz band <laughs> it was, was almost entirely accidental <laughs> um,
Yes, I remember seeing a skiffle group when I was nine. Yeah. Uh, and thinking, oh gosh, I'd love to do that. And it, it was just that it didn't look difficult, but it looked such fun. Oh, it, it is fun. Now, even now, when you're playing, if you're not having fun, you yeah. shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. So yeah. we've actually introduced, now that we've got Robin playing with the High Society Band, because he plays washboard, now and again we do break out into a skiffle number or two. And why not? And why not? People love it. Exactly. Because for the audiences, it, it's kind of taking them back to And they remember, it's the sort of thing they'll join in with. Very much so. And it's, it's a little bit different. So if you do a couple of those in the middle, that's fine. You don't have to do it all night. Oh, sure. Uh, it's a bit more variety. And uh, I think one of the things that makes the uh, High Society Band a little bit different is the, the, the actual sort of the breadth of our mm -hmm. repertoire. Yeah, we do a lot of, there's a lot of variety in there. Moving over to Colne, we find the Forest New Orleans Band playing at their weekly residency on a Tuesday, the Union Exchange in Market Street. when Jack Moore and Keith Simkin decided to play the music. Their first practice sessions were at the Pendle Forest Sports Club in Fence, just near Burnley. I'm with Arthur Stead, a mate of many years standing, yes. a fine trumpet player who you've seen tonight leading this um, 
splendid orchestra. How long has the band been going, Arthur? Oh, now, I've been with it for about 32 years, but it's been going before then. Oh, OK. Jack. Jack, Jack, Jack Moore. Yeah. Jack Moore and uh, Keith Simkin formed right. the band. OK. Uh, they needed a trumpet player. And I think it was eight, 1986. They caught me <laughs> playing with a band in Bingley, Malcolm Webb's band. Oh, OK. I was yeah. stepping with Malcolm and they were looking for a trumpet player. I just started the printing business. Yes. And I didn't want to take any more jobs on because I was playing with Ed O'Donnell. As well. Uh, oh, well. Yeah, so I said, well, I'll help you out till you get a trumpet player. And here I am, <laughs> here 32 we are. years <laughs> later. 32 <laughs> years of undetected crime. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. Well, you've got this as a residency. Yes, uh, yes. Do you play at any festivals? We, we did do, but it got to a point where some of the band didn't want to the travel too much. Yeah. And I don't want to put a band on that's half Depths. Depth, you know. That's I can go along with that. You know. So, we, this is about all we do. We play, we do get a job about every every month, five, six weeks at Bingley. Oh, OK. And uh, there's a jazz club in Bingley yes. that operates weekly. And we're there actually this Thursday. Oh. So, so, and then we're there again in June. So that, that's about all we do now. In the village of Oakworth, actually, right. where were numerous musicians. Martin Sharp was an Oakworth boy. Yeah. Malcolm Webb was an Oakworth boy. Johnny Redman, he moved into the Midlands, but he's a trumpet player. There are a number of us in that yeah. village. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and then of course it progressed to Keithley and of course the Bing American Forces Network, AFM. Yeah. And that's where I start, where I very heard the very first sort of Dixieland mm -hmm. chance, which got me started. Yeah. That's where I first heard it, yeah. I've seen that was before I was playing, you know, but once yeah. I'd heard it, I wanted you to were hooked. play. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I it's, think it happens to it's all where, of us. Yeah, most, yeah, yeah, can you imagine that? Because yeah. in, in my case, it's a silly story, but um, as a lad, mum and dad had to go down to London every so often, and um, they came back, oh, a lovely record. And um, mum gave me the money, a piece of paper with the record number written on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So I went tootling off to the record shop, came back with it, put it on. What the hell is this? I, I she was expecting Winfred Atwell. <laughs> what I got was Ken Collier playing Too Busy. <laughs> and that hooked me. Well, there's a lad in tonight. I got my first jazz records off him when he went into the 40s. And my parents were key Methodist mm -hmm. and I didn't tell them that I was but getting to, I had to smuggle them under my jumper oh, okay. and took them home and smuggled them upstairs <laughs> before I dare tell them that I'd got some jazz, you know. <gasps> such, the devil's such, music. Such, yeah, such, such was the thing about jazz. Yeah, yeah. Jimmy Nelson's sports club in Nelson was the venue for their first public appearance. They used to play regularly at the Crown in Colm. <laughs> Bye. Uh -huh. 
We've now covered our third trip to the Northwest, different bands and styles. The interviews with the musicians also covered a lot more of the local history. To summarise, the music is alive and well, despite the harbingers of doom. Importantly, there are younger musicians joining in, which bodes very well for the future. We plan to continue our documentary programme and are already planning a fourth edition that will feature the North East. Watch this space.